We have a very special evening for you. Um, my name is Nava Milliken. I'm the artistic director for the Center for Art in Wood, and uh, we are um, going to hear tonight from Trent Presler, um, the author of Little in Aachen, this book right here, um, which you can pick up at the center. Um, and um, we'll talk more about that later when we get into, um, when we hand it over to Trent and, and um, start the evening. But um, I do want to um, make sure that uh, we welcome everyone tonight and also that um, we take a moment to humbly acknowledge that we're gathered in the unsur unsurrendered ancestral indigenous territory of the Lenni Lenape and the Wingo Hawking people who were and continue to be active stewards of these lands on which the center is situated. And while we admit that this recognition is a small effort, we hold up indigenous visibility and affirm the sovereignty for individuals and community to live here now and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. Um, at the Center for Art and Wood, we work to hold the center accountable for the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. Um, so um, with that, I welcome everyone tonight on this gorgeous evening. Um, I want to introduce our guest, um, Trent Presler, who is here with us. Um, and I will just um, read from the book flap for your bio as I introduce you, Trent. Um, Trent grew up on a cattle ranch in South Dakota and received his uh, bachelor degree in science from Iowa State University in 1998. He was subsequently awarded a Rotary Scholarship to the UK and a diploma from the Royal Botanic Garden. After a White House internship for President Bill Clinton, he earned a master's in science in agricultural economics and a PhD in horticulture from Cornell University. He is now the CEO of Bedell, is that right? Sellers, and founder of Pressler Woodshop. He lives in New York um, and little and often in his first book and what a book it is. Um, so, Everybody join me in giving a welcome to Trent. Um, and um, we will um, get started by asking who among us has read little and often already? Um, and not everyone's visual, so take a second to unmute if you have and just shout your affirmation. Oh, Suzanne, Suzanne has read it. Great, Suzanne. Um, Suzanne's gonna have lots of questions then. <laughs> um, so I guess um, I wanted to get started by asking Trent, um, tell us a little bit more about um, how and where you grew up. We know it was um, a remote, very rural part of South Dakota. Oh, and you're muted. Unmuted, unmuted, sorry. Oh my gosh, here we are, we're back. You can hear and see me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, thank you for having me. This is so fun and I'm, uh, I'm, I was just telling you that I'm gonna be in, in Philadelphia this weekend for the first time, I'm very excited. And someday I'd like to come back and see the beautiful um, uh, art and wood that you have there, wood made of art or art that is wood. I need to learn more about this. It's all, <laughs> is it all oh. of the above? <laughs> all of it. Uh, we can do it all. Love it. Um, so yeah, I, um, it's actually good that not everyone on the call has uh, read my book. So we can, um, I'll try not to have some spoilers, but for Suzanne's benefit, I'll, I'll also go deep if she wants. Um, so I, yeah, I grew up in South Dakota in the extreme Western corner of the state um, on a 10,000 acre cattle ranch that my parents had. Um, I went to a one room schoolhouse, which was, um, very close to the border of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. That's an old shot of our barn. You can see that there's just like literally nothing there. It's the prairie. It feels almost, and sometimes there, it, there's moments where it feels almost like the savanna in parts of Central Africa, but um, it's very poor. Um, uh, there was a sociologist at Berkeley in the 80s who did some study where he tried to determine 
the most remote part of the United States. Um, based, he based his, his study on how far people live from a McDonald's. And um, so my family's ranch uh, was, according to this Berkeley sociologist, the most isolated part of America because we were 150 miles, 142 maybe um, miles from the closest McDonald's. Um, for whatever that's worth. And uh, I grew up, <laughs> it was, um, there's not much there, I have to say. And I, um, I escaped and went to Iowa State for college. And that felt kind of like this booming metropolis, you know, that it, it was still in Iowa, but it had like 30,000 students. And um, my parents were in a very strict religious kind of cult. And I, uh, we had like one television channel uh, growing up. So and uh, at the one room schoolhouse, our teacher would spend like one hour a day with each grade because there were eight kids in school where I went to school. And um, then so I'd have an hour with the teacher and then the rest of the day was free to just kind of learn on my own. And I think that's what began my sort of self starter um, trait that has has served me well in things like building a canoe, for example, or writing a book. Um, so yeah, there's kind of your just the cliff notes of where it all began. <laughs> um, oh, that's actually some of our horses. So that's a good example of, it's hard to explain, especially to people from the East Coast, like what South Dakota is like, if you haven't been there. It's, there's just no trees because it's so dry. And um, it was the bottom of the um, uh, Western Interior Sea uh, about, I don't remember, 70 million years ago, or is it 7 million? Anyway, a very long time ago, that was the bottom of an inland ocean. And, and so there are a lot of marine fossils. Oddly, you can walk across there and find seashells and fish fossils that were part of the sea. And there's a dense concentration of dinosaur fossils there too. Um, in fact, the two or three most complete uh, Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons ever found were found pretty close to where I grew up in a town called Faith, South Dakota. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's another world. That's my father. So we'll talk more about him too. Uh, he's pretty much the subject of the book, but he was a rodeo star, uh, 1968 rodeo champion. Um, <clears throat> and the thing I always love to point out, well, there's two things. One is that we have the same hands. My hands are very similar to my dad's. And um, also that like, even though cowboys are like wrestling a 500 pound calf to the ground, he has a starched shirt. Like there's creases up his collar up, up his sleeve and he's wearing a Timex watch like if you zoom in it's like two in the afternoon or something like that it's just wild <laughs> um I saw a question just pop up someone asked if there's an audio version of the book and I'm sorry if I'm going off topic but yes there is <laughs> it's on Amazon Audible and it was narrated by uh, my dog is drinking behind me come here you can probably hear that loud and clear um it was narrated by the actor Matt Bomer, and it's really good. Like he did a great job. So yes, there is an audible. It's quite lovely. Excellent, excellent. Um, here's another um, figure oh, yes. who, who appears in the book. Yes, this is my sister Lucinda, um, a beloved um, person in all of our lives in the family, but also um, uh, tragically, she died when she was 25 of a rare neurological disorder. Um, and she's a big part of my inspiration for why I got into woodworking, actually. And, um, um, you know, I kind of have felt for a long time that I was living life for two people because she couldn't do many things uh, mm -hmm. for much of her life. Um, but she's a real sweetheart. I love that picture, too. That was at the Special Olympics, <clears throat> probably in, I don't know, 19, I'm going to say that's like 1990 maybe so mm. back in the day very sweet mm. so um just to just to give um, people a visual context for for your discussion i'll jump ahead to some images you share that are more um more connected to the present yes and, yes uh, so this is um so the subject of my book, uh, the basis of my book essentially is that my father died of cancer in 2014 and gave me his toolbox. And I used his tools to build a 20 foot long wooden canoe, which is what you see right there. And that's my dog Caper, who's a um, loving heroic companion throughout the book. And um, the, the crazy thing that um, 
I like to say, well, you got to read the book to see how crazy it was. But I, I built the canoe in my house, in my living room. Like I literally kind of threw away most of my earthly possessions uh, just to make room for this thing because it was 20 feet long. And it was a rental cottage, like a beach bungalow. It wasn't even like a big house. And I, I didn't have a garage and it was the middle of winter. And so I just thought, well, I'm going to build this in my house. I live right on the water. Um, on the North Fork of Long Island, which is about 80 miles east of New York City, um, surrounded by sand dunes and trees. But yeah, that's probably about halfway through the process, I would say, that picture. The boat's almost done, and I'm almost closed in the top opening there. But yeah, I made a big mess in my house. It looks pretty clean in that photo, actually. <laughs> it's a fantastic photo. Um, uh -huh. And um, yeah, so well. When project has concluded yes I did finish it um I mean there is there are some cliffhangers in the book you wonder how I'm going to finish it or when or how I'll get through this um uh but I did and I actually paddled it on the anniversary of my dad's death in December in a little bit of a storm squall and um uh this wasn't that day but we had I had a friend who's a photographer who came back the following year and kind of reenacted it with me on like a nice snowy day so that's what that's from. And that's Peconic Bay. So that water there um, is what separates um, the eastern tip of Long Island. So Long Island splits into the North Fork and the South Fork at the very eastern end. The South Fork is known more famously as the Hamptons. And then the North Fork is kind of like, it's just the North Fork, but people call it like the Brooklyn of the Hamptons, sort of. Um, so that's about four miles across, very shallow water uh, that separates those two land masses. Excellent. Thank you for, for describing the the geography. Yeah. Um, and oh. then here we have additional, yeah. I call these calendar shots. Yeah, calendar <laughs> shot. That's a great shot of the canoe. You can really see the sort of shape of it. And um, that's also the Conic Bay. And this and this marking for, um, for our audience, this marking that you have um, at the back. Oh, yes. That's my brand. So I, um, you know, growing up on a cattle ranch, we branded all of our cattle um, and uh, we had a family insignia. And so when I was building the canoe, I asked my mom to mail me the family branding iron and it got lost by UPS. Um, it was so tragic and bizarre. We were like, of all the things to get lost in the mail, they lost our family heirloom branding iron. So uh, I used that as kind of a motivation that, well, to think, well, I should come up with my own brand and my own identity um and um so that's what that little insignia is there and the book there is a chapter devoted to kind of the the logo and how how it what it means the symbols what the symbols mean and then oh yes just a, my friend alan and i out for a paddle you can see the hamptons in the distance there it looks pretty you know scary it's not <laughs> that deep that looks like oceanic and like terrifying to me <laughs> It's like the water's like black, basically. <laughs> you can keep the viewer um, in suspense about that. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, we can, you know, by demand, we can flip back to images if, if people want mm -hmm. to refer to something or want to be reminded of something we saw there. Those sure. are available to our presentation tonight. Cool. Um, but um, thank you for giving us a little bit of overview, visual overview of the yeah. um, of the book, which is which is appropriately, it's a memoir, um, and and it it describes your. I mean, you are not you are not really old enough to write a memoir in the true <laughs> sense. I mean, I frankly, suppose I'm 44. <laughs> um, you have more more to go, but but it but it really is written like a memoir, um, and and the detail and the um, vulnerability that is expressed in this book is is um, um, it's captivating. It draws the viewer intently into the events of your life as they play out. And it also um, charts your um, path from, from well, sort of sidles back and forth between your life and really important and key events in the life of a child growing up right. um, in one of the most remote um, areas of the United States and the present um, bringing you to woodworking, um, and not just woodworking, but um, but <laughs> taking yeah. on the very ambitious project, first woodworking project of building um, yeah. a canoe. And we'll get to that in a second. But 
Um, I wanted to ask um, about that use of, of memory. You will afford me a little bit of literary criticism and theory for a moment. Please, I love it. Let's go, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the whole method um, that you use when you tell this story is, is kind of um, switching back between memory and, um, and the actions of, of, right. um, of the boat building and the process that you take in, in thinking yeah. it through um, and researching and, and gathering. Um, your materials and also your wits about you as you set out to make this pro to do this project. So could yes. you tell me a little bit about how um, how that method developed? Yes. Um, well, you know, that's really why it took me over two years to write the book because it was really hard to get that right, um, to get the flashbacks right. And in the very beginning, you know, my editor said, write everything down first and then let him decide what stays and goes. And so I had like key, let's say I had maybe 10 key memories of my father uh, from childhood. And then I have, so that's kind of up here. And then I had the timeline of myself building this wooden canoe over the course of a calendar year. So the challenge was like, I didn't want to write like a prescriptive book about like, basically here's how you build a wooden canoe from start to finish. Um, because part of my journey was um, healing from the deaths of my sister and my father, understanding my father through the use of his tools. Um, my dad and I were estranged for quite a long time, um, around 14 years. And uh, it had mostly to do with the fact that I'm gay and he was a sort of, you know, religious conservative cattle ranching Vietnam vet tough guy. And uh, <laughs> we didn't quite see eye to eye on some things. And he had called me home right before he died and, and presented me with the toolbox. Um, so I knew it was important as I wrote and toggled back and forth with the structure of the book that like anytime I used a tool on the boat that it like it triggered a memory of dad basically. Um, so the book is, um, it's almost like two books in one. It's kind of like there's me building this canoe in New York in 2015. And then there's me as a kid growing up in a really harsh environment on a ranch with dad. And uh, I think it turned out okay. I've gotten a lot of feedback on the structure of the story, but we worked pretty hard on that. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that it allows us to do is, is participate um, as readers, you know, emotionally and kind of share the pain of yeah. it. And then, and then, get a very deep understanding, you know, in as much as, as um, we are observers to the story um, of how you really poignantly connect those memories to the work that you are doing, yeah. you know, and, um, and you, 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 it's, it's, you know, it's generous in its vulnerability because, because we are participating right. in it and you've invited right. us to do that and what is, what is actually yeah. a very, very raw story. Yeah. Yeah. I, so like my editor and I talked a lot about how and what, how you decide what stays in a memoir and what, what gets deleted. And, and we wanted, it's almost like a condensed soup. What's left is like the really intense stuff. <laughs> um, you know, 90% of life is probably like drinking coffee and complaining about traffic, but like you don't include all that in your book because no one's going to read it or care. Um, so it was like, it was like I had to kind of interrogate my memory to go back and um, connect the dots and find the thread of commonality between me and my dad. And ha whenever one of those memories kind of in some way related to a tool or the canoe, then it was like perfect in that it would help us go even deeper and deeper emotionally into the story of how building this boat helped me understand my father and forgive him and you know really forgive myself too. Um, so yeah, it, it's very broad, very vulnerable. It was like therapy writing it. <clears throat> it was also kind of re-traumatizing to write it because I had to go to all these places. Um, but it's funny, when I built the canoe, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I never thought I was going to write a book. I never thought, oh, working with my hands is therapeutic. None of that. Like it wasn't, I wasn't conscious of what was happening. I was just literally just building a canoe because I, I wanted to, because I lived on the water and it seemed like a fun thing to do. So... <laughs> Well, don't undersell it. I mean, there, <laughs> you do describe um, some a really. It, there's a really powerful moment when it does feel like there is um, there is therapy through the physical interaction 
with the tools. I mean, this is a lot if you think about it because yeah. these are your father's tools. Um, this was your inheritance um, yes. this, from him to you. He yeah. had some foresight clearly about, about what they were going to do to your life. Yes. Uh, and that he knew that you would be using them, that you yeah. wouldn't uh, just let them sit in the closet. So, so there's this, this paragraph where you talk about the first bangings of the, his hammer um, right yeah which, you know it in and of itself that tool connects to a memory yes um, and oh yes maybe the most intense memory of the whole book i think well one of a couple but yeah i don't know if i should spoil that for people but the hammer was um joe <laughs> yeah the hammer was you know that's kind of the first one that came up because i used the hammer first to build the canoe and it was also really connected to something very profound between me and my dad and uh so it was like, it's funny, by the time I get to that place, you're almost halfway through the book. And then I think it's like, wham, okay, here we are. <laughs> exactly. And that's when it, but that's when it happens, right? That's when it, yes. the whole project, the woodworking story starts. Yes. Um, because you are, you're, you're regaining your tool confidence um, mm. and your muscle memory, but it's also connecting um, in, in somewhat painful, well, in clearly painful ways to, yeah. to um, event memory. Um, and then there is this kind of catharsis that comes from yeah. putting tool <clears throat> to material. And you describe yes. it as your, it's a bang, the dialogue between you and the um, Oh, sound. yes. Bang, yeah. yes. Bang, yes. Like it was like, um, that's when it started to click that this was satisfying. Um, and that working with my hands was going to be somewhat enjoyable despite the foibles and mishaps along the way. Um, and it's interesting as I developed as a writer and as a boat builder, the book kind of gained steam, I think, um, because I start to learn that this is a therapeutic practice and I start to like, like crave my time with the boat. Like I had to go on some business trips and um, around the country and I couldn't wait that, to come back just so I could keep working. And um, so it was, um, yeah, you do get a sense throughout the book about how my perspective on the tools changes, my perspective on myself and my dad changes. And, mm -hmm. and I think my, it's sort of the meta thing, but my ability as a writer kind of improved and changed too as the book went on. Cause it like, I'm really proud of the last like third of the book. Um, I mean, I'm proud of it all, but I, I, I'm, tied it all together pretty well at the end. I mean, Suzanne might be the only one that's read it, so she knows all about the ending, but. <laughs> um, um, have, but this is the first time that you've written in prose, right? Be, I mean, you yes. clearly have written, you have a lot of experience in writing, you have a PhD in horticulture. Um, yeah, but nothing in prose, nothing personal. I mean, a PhD is like, it's prescriptive, you know, you're, <laughs> you're following scientific method. Like there was nothing creative about it at all. And certainly nothing personal either. So yeah, this was the first time I really had written anything, mm -hmm. uh, anything like it. And, um, you know, there was one point where I wanted to quit. I didn't think that the first couple drafts were good enough. And the editor, I mean, it was brutal. Editing was brutal, but you know, my editor was very patient and he said, we're going to get there and we just have to keep going. And it's exhausting. And it's going to be completely exhausting, but you have to keep going. And He's done some major books. He edited um, Marley and Me, and he was, um, I think he was involved somewhat in Tuesdays with Maury or Eat, Pray, Love. I don't remember what was going on in his publisher in his career. But anyway, he's um, a pretty big uh, memoir guy at HarperCollins, and he, I, I credit him so much with helping me get through this. That's, that's <clears throat> um, everyone needs a good editor. Yeah. Um, so let's jump ahead to uh, the canoe story. Um, um, and this is a, this is a multi-part question, but I'll start sure. with um, um, why a canoe? Um, right. That, you know, it's your first woodworking, it's your first, well, I, I mean, probably yeah. aside from, from um, repair work in your childhood and the necessary um, yeah. things that needed to be done on the farm. This was really your yeah. friend's own first sure. woodworking project. So why my, did you start out on something so ambitious? <laughs> well, yeah, my mom always said, like, she was thinking I would build her a cutting board or something. And um, 
you know, mom said dad could build anything. And I took that as kind of a challenge that, well, if he could build anything, then maybe I could too. And um, I lived on the water at the time. And I also had some memories of dad from a kid, as a kid, we would go duck hunting um, in these like cattail sloughs in South Dakota. And um, the hunters would like strap cattails around canoes and small boats and dinghies to shield them from view of the docks. And so, I sort of thought, well, it'd be cool to build a, a fancy wooden version of those really humble, like aluminum hunting boats that I knew growing up. Um, and uh, I think also I just was sort of mesmerized by the by living on the water and kind of seeing in the distance, there was an island called Robbins Island, uh, sort of that separates the Hamptons from the North Fork. And I kind of, it's um, it had like a fishing dock on the end with a light. And it was a little bit like Great Gatsby because this light would come on at night and I would just stare at it from my house. <laughs> like, I wonder what it's like over there. And I, well, I guess I have to, you know, paddle over there if I'm ever going to see it. So um, yeah, I guess. And it was kind of just also crazy. I mean, this was all a little bit of a, of a manic life moment. So I built a canoe. <laughs> well, that, well, that leads me to the second part of this question is that not only did you embark upon building a canoe, but you did it um, in your own house after purging your, your belongings. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's a live work kind of prospect. Live, yeah. I mean, I was literally, I was living with the canoe, sleeping under it, sleeping around it sleep, with wood shavings everywhere and tools everywhere. And the house was a mess and um, I even broke a window using a saw, a table saw once. And it, uh, I mostly did it for the practical reason that I didn't have a garage. And so I was like, well, if I'm gonna do this, I have to do it here in my house. And then it, you know, as it progressed, it became kind of like, yeah, I was living with my grief. You know, the canoe became this manifestation of my grief and having all the wood around me and the smell of wood shavings in my house, the whole thing was basically like I was immersed in grief and immersed in my process of how I was going to manage to get through that somehow. <clears throat> and at the time were you, when you started this sort of another literary um, parallel, a Moby Dick project, yeah. um, were you aware that you were going to build successive canoes? Oh no, I thought I was just going to build one, which is why um, I built such a big one. <laughs> I thought, well, if I'm only going to build one canoe in my life, I better make it a big one. So, um, but you know, ultimately I loved it so much that years later, I, I now make canoes. I make like one canoe a year for private clients and I love the work and the work is meditative and um, sort of my happy place. So, but I never expected then that I would continue doing it. Um, not even in the slightest. Um, and what, so, so what was the, what were the measurements of your first canoe? Um, it was 20 feet long and, f uh, I think the beam in the middle was, uh, 48 inches. So four mm -hmm. feet by 20 feet. It's large. It was, um, it was like a pack canoe, like a guide canoe from Maine. So like the French fur traders would, they modified the indigenous models of canoe that were used forever. And they, they kind of gave them like a wider bottom so that they could haul um, like furs and, and trade up and down rivers and lakes in the Northeastern US. So it was a pretty flat bottomed and stable design. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, I still don't even, um, I've never made one like that since the other boats that I've made are um, smaller, <laughs> more manageable. Um, I saw a question pop up while you popped away and now it just, it disappeared, but I think it was about the title of the book. Uh, oh, but no, I, I'm saving that no. one for the end. Ah, so okay. Okay. <laughs> we will, we will save our questions for the end. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so you cleared out your house of possessions. You even went so far as to paint some of your walls with blackboard paint so you could sketch out while you were building. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've mentioned to the audience your inspiration or your guide for building this uh, project. Oh, I haven't. Um, well, there is a, a book, um, like a almost like a pamphlet um, called Building a Strip Canoe by Gil Gilpatrick, who was this, who now is still alive. He's like 95 years old. He lives in Maine and he, 
he built wooden canoes as like school class projects at a high school in Maine, in Skowegan, Maine. And he's built like hundreds and hundreds of canoes. And so I got this little book and it was like step-by-step -step instructions on, it didn't even have a hard cover. It was like, I don't know, like a, like a glorified pamphlet almost, uh, but it's my Bible. I don't know if oh, I have a copy. Look, uh, Brent has one he's showing us. Oh, really? I mean, let me look, let me slide my screen over. I might have one some. Oh yeah, there you go. Okay. Wow. That's it. I have a previous version that has a different cover on it, but that is the actual book. Um, I don't know. I, it's somewhere in the shelf behind me, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> I had one from like 19, I think it was from 86 or 82 or something and had a little bit of a different cover, but um, yeah. <laughs> I would like to meet that guy. And I sent him a copy of the book in Maine, but I didn't hear back. I don't quite know. He doesn't really have a website. So I'm, I need to get serious about that because I think he's 95. I need to like actually. Oops, you're, you've muted. I'm muted, sorry. Gosh, let me just stop swiping, but I got to get back to the main screen. There we go. Okay. Thanks. Anyway. Yeah. Um, thanks for showing us, Brent. That's okay. that's inspiring. Um, so so we did talk a little bit about uh, we did touch on the physicality of work um, and how that can connect to the physicality or the physical experience of healing. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could go a little bit uh, deeper into that without giving away details from the book. Sure. Um, well, um, I think that I had to kind of wrap my head around um, what it meant to build my life back up from nothing. And that directly paralleled building this canoe. Because it's not like it was carved. Like if you take an object of wood and you carve something, you're starting with a lot and you're whittling it down. With a canoe, you start with a boat, you start with nothing and you're building it up strip by strip. And it's painful and painstaking and it takes forever. And you have to just like, just do a little bit every day. And, um, and it came um, to sort of symbolize for me also the process of just grieving everything that I had been through in life. And that I think I sort of might expected it at some point that it would just happen quickly. Like, oh, okay, half my family's dead. Well, you know, I'll get over it. But like, no, it's very, um, just like the physical process of getting your muscles in shape or building a boat. Like, I think that we forget sometimes how iterative life is. And um, we want to just have everything immediately because we can just, we can order my book on Amazon. We can do anything you want instantly, but like not healing um, and not building. So, um, but I did have to kind of be broken down, I think physically and emotionally um, by the task of working with wood. Um, the wood kind of was tougher than me. And uh, I didn't quite understand it for a long time and, and I had to respect it before I could, you know, get it to kind of do what I wanted to do. Mm. And I think I had to respect myself too, to get where I wanted to be emotionally by the end of the book. So <clears throat> a lot of parallels, so many parallels. <laughs> yeah, the, the book is definitely, it makes you aware of those parallels too. Yeah. And, and it encourages you to think about them in your own life, I think. Um, and, um, I, I would love to hear, and I'm sure that our, our viewers here would also love to hear, um, a little bit, um, uh, more personal, um, sort of uh, revelations or, or, um, takeaways from your experience, um, learning woodworking and then mm. experiencing the wood itself. And with the understanding that you have a PhD in horticulture, you know, plants, right. And plants. yeah. Yes. and species. Yes, I mean, that was in some ways my entree to the wood world because the first time I went to a, um, like a lumber yard to get wood, at least I knew what the species were because I was a botanist. And so I could be like, oh, I could like talk the language a little bit. And um, it was just enough to kind of get me in the door with a tiny bit of legitimacy, <laughs> even though I did not know what I was doing. At least I kind of understood the like the porosity of wood and the different weights of wood. And I didn't specialize in 
um, lumber in graduate school, but I did do my PhD in perennial woody plants. I, work, I focused on grapevines because my day job, I work at a winery. So, you know, the vascular system is pretty similar for all of them. It's like a, it's like a tube, like a spaghetti, a package of spaghetti, basically, and all those tubes carrying water and nutrients up and down, and that's how you get wood. Um, but uh, it was, um, you know, for me, I didn't quite ever really know the beautiful properties of wood because on the ranch, my dad had built fences and barns and things, but they were always with like crooked juniper or cedar posts and just stuff that, um, you know, not like pretty wood. Nothing was like varnished or polished. It was all rough outdoor stuff. So, um, uh, you know, it's funny. There's a scene in the book um, where I go to buy the lumber for the first time. And I always thought that I was like insecure at the lumber yard because I was gay and because I did not know how to build anything. And so there's all these burly men around like showing me lumber. But it wasn't until I published this book and then one of my readers, someone who I respect a lot, who's going to be on our Zoom on Saturday night on the queering of the woodworking space, Laura Mays, she sent me a note and it was so eye-opening because she said, you know, how many women read that chapter and have like gone to a lumber yard and, and been, you know, condescended to by guys or just sort of not treated like they should be there right and, and I didn't think about that she was like you still present as a white dude and so I still just waltzed into a lumber yard and the owner helped me buy wood and she was like isn't that just a testament to um a lot of things <laughs> but um and I, I was like wow I didn't even I had to check my own privilege because I thought on the inside I just felt like an inexperienced gay guy who had no business being in a lumber yard but on the outside I suppose it was like there's yet another like you know, middle-aged white dude who's going to buy wood and build a project, do a DIY project at home, which is totally normal and accepted. So, well, except I'm so glad you mentioned that that part of the book yeah. for that exact reason, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm so thrilled that you and Laura connected and that you know we'll be doing the same on in our yeah. talk on Saturday. But um, that that mm -hmm. immediately came to my mind when I read that part. Is that yeah. Okay, so here's the experience that women, every yeah. single woman I've ever spoken with who who has a need to buy wood um, yeah. is going through the same, you know, internally, but also externally having to perform yeah. or present or justify their knowledge yeah. in order to get what they need with um, and yeah. Well, it's sad and it, it's frustrating because, I mean, I've been asked a few times, especially because it's Pride Month, like, have I faced discrimination in being, I mean, being in a non-traditional field for gay people? I don't know, I probably know two LGBT people in the woodworking community. I don't know a single gay person in, in boat building. Um, and I always say, like, that I actually haven't faced direct discrimination. I get, you know, there's like name calling on, on social media by trolls who will say any nasty thing but but I said I've said a couple times in other interviews that I just feel like the more important thing is that we raise up um, women and people of color in woodworking because I think that I can still present as just like your normal white dude that does things and they're expected to but um, and I, I'm, I'm this is my new sort of mission is that like <laughs> I want to amplify other voices and I'm I know that it's gay pride month and I want to amplify LGBTQ but like I feel like I'm I'm sort of becoming more aware of my own privilege in that community so yeah I think that that's going to be a new thing for me and I have seen I have very close friends from Instagram there's an amazing woodworking community on Instagram and I've met people through there that I never would have met in a million years uh, including boat builders and furniture builders and a lot of them, some of my closest friends uh, from that community are women. And and I see them like they'll post some posts about woodworking and then just sometimes people say the most horrifying things in the comments on social media and I just don't get it. And it brings out like the ugly underbelly of America. So uh, anyway, maybe that's off topic, but I am um, part of the wonderful side effect of this, of getting my father's tools and building a canoe has been this whole new community of people that I never would have met otherwise. And I also credit a lot of Instagram to that because I started Instagram when I was building the canoe because mom wanted to see pictures of like what I was doing with dad's tools. And so I was just sort of innocently putting up photos uh, in 2015. And then 
I had a couple of video process videos that went viral. And one of my canoe building videos got picked up by Board Panda, which is like a clickbait thing. And it just, um, it just exploded. And I started getting like thousands of followers for these, like, I would do these minute videos of how to build a canoe. But it's funny, everything on social media now has a beginning, middle and end. So like, people post things where like, oh, I'm gonna, whatever, make this shake. And then in the 30 seconds at the end, you have something that's a finished product. And with canoes, there's never a finished product, not for like a year or more. <laughs> and so all my videos were these minute process videos of like, all right, no background video, almost like a cooking show. It's like, we're going to glue two pieces of wood together. All right, we're gonna clamp it. Okay, and then the glue is gonna drip out of the joint. And that's the video. <laughs> and it was like, I didn't think it was revolutionary, but they kind of went viral because people were like, that's so mesmerizing. ASMR. <laughs> ASMR, yeah. And so I didn't realize that this canoe building process, even though I, I was processing grief, but also there was this ASMR quality to the whole thing where physically touching it and sanding it and scraping it and planing it, all those like, physical touch interactions with the wood were also kind of soothing to me and, and kind of sucked out some of the anxiety, mm -hmm. I think, <laughs> absorbed. Yeah. No, I think, I think that quality, um, I mean, I'm not going to speak for the woodworkers amongst us, but I, I think that that quality of the material and what it demands from people who are trying to shape it does draw, um, yeah help those feelings and um and it's part of the appeal of working with it yeah absolutely and i've i've had this debate often and there's a little talk about it in the book too but about um art versus craft with wood and um the canoes that i make are kind of like i apply the principles of super yacht luxury super yachts to canoes which is very unexpected for people to process like canoes are utilitarian historically they're supposed to be lightweight and you drag them through the, through the woods you scratch them up and then you throw them into the lake and your kids like get fish guts in them. Like that's what everyone thinks a canoe is supposed to be for. And I, so I take a much different approach. I make canoes that have like all these luxury finishings like bronze trim and leather seats. And um, I want them to feel luxurious and I don't care that they weigh 200 pounds because you shouldn't go canoeing alone anyway. You should always have someone with you to help carry the thing. So um but uh, when I finished the first couple, well, the first one, but especially the subsequent canoes, people would say, oh, it's art. And I would be like, well, you know, it floats, it's a boat. So I don't know if that can be really art because like art should not be, maybe art's not functional. So, um, and I had a debate with a friend where, you know, we talked about like, well, how could you make a canoe that was true art? And, you know, I guess it couldn't float. I mean, then if it doesn't float, then it's no longer a boat. So maybe it could be art then. And like, it's just this round and around and around. And um, I suppose it's for other people to decide if it's art, but um, I'm more interested. I want to come to your museum because I'm, I'm fascinated now by like this intersection between art, wood art and wood craft and where that line is drawn and how thick and thin that line is and, you know, who's on one side and who's on the other. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think um, we have found, um, and Albert at some point can also speak to this. Albert is here with us tonight, and he's the um, co-founder of the center. Um, but I think um, looking at um, material and visual culture through the lens of a specific material does allow you Mm -hmm. to move beyond those um, sort of initial gatekeeping uh, subjects of, of what is art and what is craft, uh, what is design and what is function and why is right. that art and so on. Um, and it does sound right. like though, I do enjoy those conversations, I will say, and it sounds like something that connects maybe to your other job or your day job, which is yes. um, the CEO of a winery. So I think we need to lubricate <laughs> that discussion yeah. with some with the wine tasting. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I wish I had a bottle right here, a glass. I would drink some. But I, um, yeah, so for about 15 years, I've been the CEO of a vineyard here on Long Island. We have 100 acres of land. We farm our grapes sustainably. Um, we have about 50 employees and um, it's a beautiful place to work. And like woodworking, it's very um, slow kind of work. Like you grow the grapes and then you press the grapes and you bottle the wine and maybe the wine will sit 
or maybe it'll sit in an oak barrel for a year or steel tank. And there are some wines we don't release until <clears throat> two or three years after their harvest date. And then there are some wines that we release right away. And, um, but yeah, it's in its way, it's its own artistic practice and we're crafting things slowly over time and we have to be very patient with it. It's got a lot of parallels, I think, to, to boat building. Absolutely. Um, yeah, <clears throat> it's fun. And I, I split my time, um, you know, I've, I've, although the last two years I've been working on the book and I've barely been in my wood shop and I'm taking a little time off now to kind of just rest after the book launch. And um, maybe I'll get back into the shop like in July and start building stuff again. I have a new canoe commissioned. Actually, it's interesting. I have a canoe commissioned by a country music singer in Nashville. It's the first time I've been commissioned for a canoe that's not ever going to be used. He wants to like literally hang it on the mantle, fireplace mantle. Um, he has a, like a 16 foot wide fireplace. <laughs> So that's going to be kind of big, but like, he's like, well, it should be functional, but it's just going to be treated like art. So anyway, I know my, my thought about art versus craft is like rudimentary stuff compared to the things that you guys think about every day. So I really want to come to the museum and dig a little deeper. <laughs> you, anytime you have an open <laughs> invitation. Um, I, I just, um, I want to open it up to, um, the people who are gathered here because I'm sure they have questions but Suzanne and I had one question in common so I will um, conclude my part of this with that question um, which is um, the question of the title of the book little and often um, mm. could you um, you do you do um, go into it a little bit in the book but um, yeah I think specifically to our conversation here, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this this advice or this motto translates to woodworking specifically. Sure. Yeah. You know, I was asked this on, it's a good reason to bring up CBS. So I was on CBS Sunday morning with Jane Pauley a couple days ago, and it was the way they edited the interview was very raw. Like they focused on my personal stuff with my dad and um, they barely talked about woodworking. But they did ask the same question what, about the title of the book and they asked what it meant. And so without like spoiling it by telling you about the chapter with my father, where obviously this, this saying uh, stems from him and from an experience I had with him as a kid. Um, but what it means to me is that extraordinary things can happen if we commit ourselves to ordinary practice of something every single day. So I've time and time again in my life, I've, I've had to relearn this lesson. So when I wrote my PhD, it was the same thing like, oh, I just had to do my lab research and snip these grape clusters and write. And four years later, you look back and you get your degree and you're like, I can't believe I did that. Um, but it happened little and often. Um, building the boat, I had to put on one strip of wood at, at, at a time, um, you know, and let, let the glue dry for a day and come back the next day and do another strip. And so it was just like little and often. It's the only way you can build a boat. And like a boat will beat you over the head and tell you, like you can't do it any other way. Like <laughs> it's just the one way. Um, and so as I, as I thought about that, um, the title of the book, and as I was writing, it became kind of more of a philosophy for life in general. So I think a lot of things in life happen little and often. I mean, glaciers scour the landscape little and often and trees grow little and often. Um, the tides of the ocean come in and out little and often and they bring in good and they carry out bad. And all these beautiful things in life happen little and often. And unfortunately, so do things like cancer. And, um, you know, we're all living and dying slowly a little bit, I think, every day. And I don't mean that in like a terribly morose kind of sense, but it's the truth of the world. And um, so the title, by the end of the book, I feel like, I hope anyway, that I've justified the title in more ways than just the physical act of building the boat little and often, but. <laughs> That's that's fantastic. Thank you, Trent. I, I like, um, well, at least I like the unedited answer to um, the question better than the edited version. No offense. <laughs> yes, they did a wonderful job. I know they did. It was, I mean, I'm grateful for six minutes on national TV, but boy, it was a couple of days of interviews to get those six minutes is pretty shocking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we have we do have some questions. Sure. Um, and um, firstly, I love this question from Suzanne um, asking how, um, it, or if you can address the influence um, 
and support of your friends and peers. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to use her language during this rather out of the box endeavor. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I had been through this series of rough, rough times when I started building the canoe and I was alone. I was kind of, it was snowing, it was wintry. I was building this boat and I had kind of pushed a lot of my friends away. I had gone through a terrible divorce like the year before. And, um, but my friends started showing up for me. Um, my first one was my friend Dave who came out and from the city and he kind of walked into my house and he saw the wood everywhere and the fridge had no food in it. And he was like, what is going on? <laughs> Um, he's like, are you okay? This doesn't, you don't seem okay. Um, so the, another, a, a, a great part of the book that I enjoyed was that I got to incorporate three or four um, good friends that showed up for me during the course of my canoe building year and helped me see myself. They had, they held up a mirror basically, like you're not all right. This is weird. What you're doing is not normal. <laughs> um, and by the end of the year, I had more, it all comes together, let's just say, but um, I love those friends. In fact, I had two of those friends from the book at my house watching the CBS piece on Sunday. So it all comes full circle. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And then Suzanne follows up with a question. Um, I think we all want to know also, um, when your mother came to visit during the construction of um, the canoe, and also I want to know what her reaction was to the CBS um, six minutes. Uh, yes, yeah, so mom, um, oh, should I talk about, well, mom's, mom came to visit while I was building the canoe and, and that was a whole scene, but it was how I, when I first started to see mom as a human and not as like just mom, but as like a person who had gone, who had experienced traumatic loss in her life and was just trying her best to kind of stumble forward. Um, and then, um, uh, I, oh gosh. So mom called me after CBS on Sunday and uh, we had a good cry. And so mom has not read the book. Um, she rightfully so, I think is, is, you know, scared of the emotions that it's going to resurface for her. And look, I told her you've earned the right to do whatever you want. Like uh, I didn't write the book for her to gain her approval. I wrote the book for myself and, and for pe to help people. And so I hoped, I said, I hope you read it. And I hope that, you know, you see how this is helping people heal and cope. And it already has. And I've got like hundreds and hundreds of letters from readers to, to prove it. And, um, but the CBS was kind of like her cliff notes, I guess, in a way. Um, but it still makes her, I think, tremendously sad thinking about, um, you know, while my sister was dying of her disease and, and dad and I had conflict, I was also gay and like struggling and learning how to even know who I was in an environment and in a part of the world where there was not a single role model. Um, I didn't even, I didn't meet a gay person until I went to college and I was like almost 20 years old mm -hmm. in Iowa, uh, you know. So mom and I have an interesting relationship and, but it's, we're much closer than than, than ever before so sure but she is this constant presence in your life even if you know yeah. even if she's the mom entity yes uh, and then and then you know when she becomes a full-fledged human in your mind yes um, yes yeah she's always there she was always kind of this intermediary between me and dad in the mm -hmm. book and in life she was always kind of like helping me communicate helping dad communicate like in fact, when I went home and I was still in denial that dad was dying and he was, you know, trying to give me the tools, I was like, oh, I'll come back at Christmas and get them. And my mom was like, honey, no, like take the tools, put them in your car. Like she's like practically like walking them to the car for me because she knew, um, she knew he was dying and she knew what they meant even when I was still clueless, so. Yeah. Um <laughs> Uh, she she really does strike me um, in the pages of the book as an amazing human being, um, and um, she is. <laughs> and, uh, she would never think of herself as one though. She's so, you know. I told her I said people think you're like the hero of the book, Mom. Isn't that so cool? Like, you're so strong and you're so awesome. And she's like, what do they know? <laughs> they don't know me. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, they don't know you. All right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Brent, 
um, who has shown us generously shown us the um, the Gilpatrick book uh, asks. Well, first he comments that he enjoyed the book, and um, and then he asks if you draw plans for your canoes freehand um, now, um, now that you're experienced an experienced boat builder, mm -hmm. um, or do you use CAD or other um, sort of design tools? Right. So I. Um... I'm terrible with CAD. I tried, I can't. I'm just not, that's not how my brain is wired. Um, so I have, excuse me, I have a new boat that I'm that I'm working on. It's called the Caper. It's named after my dog. Mm -hmm. And it's like, a, it's um, it's kind of a modified canoe. It has an open transom at the back. So I can, I can put in a little electric motor. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm working on it. Although it's not finished, it's going to have, the front will look like a canoe and the back will be open. But I had to work with a naval architect in Newport, Rhode Island to do to design that. So, you know, he has computer programs. I don't even know what boat builder like naval architects use. It's not CAD, I think it's something else. And they can do pretests on the computer. So they'll do the boat design and then they can float it and find out like the coefficients of how, how deep under the surface of the water it sinks when it's got full weight, um, full load. Um, the drag, you know, the aerodynamics, the water dynamics, all kinds of things that I don't understand. So um, I'll mm -hmm. never understand those things. And I've decided it's not my place to, there are people that do that for a living that are great at it. So I take, I've taken those plans and I'm now building another boat that's gonna be, I think, just unlike anything that exists in the world. It's kind of like a hybrid skiff canoe. Um, and I'm building it as a prototype for myself first, and then maybe I'll take it to some wooden boat shows around the country, but we'll see. I got to get back in the shop. <laughs> I think. Um, so uh, Joe has written um, in the comments, a uh, kind of beautiful um, um, observation about, about the art and craft and canoe question. Okay. Uh, and with, Joe, do you, would you like me to read this comment out loud to everyone? I can do that. Um, a canoe hangs on a wall is obviously art rather than craft. I immediately thought of a boat made of a wood with natural voids or holes. Maybe it would float, but you couldn't paddle it. I think it would be art. It could be very beautiful. Thank I you. agree. I'd love to build a boat full of holes. I think that'd be amazing, like a non-floating boat art. I think that'd be so good. Um, I actually had some crazy thoughts about that at one point where I was going to build one and then destroy it or put drill mm -hmm. holes in it or something. And then I never quite got <laughs> there. What I decided is I need to buy someone else's canoe, like a cheap beat around canoe from like a yard sale and do that with that instead of with one that I've just spent a year building. <laughs> so maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll have some porous boat at some point. Um. You you have room you have time to explore yeah. it and write another memoir. <laughs> I'll call it the <laughs> the holy boat or something or the boat that won't float. <laughs> <laughs> we will await that eagerly. Um, <laughs> until then, I will just um, open allow everyone to unmute and say hi. Um, and um, while we do that, uh, Trent, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is. You are so generously open and raw in this book and um, the way that you invite everyone to share in these experiences um, through the framework of your exploratory boat building um, and woodworking. It is just, um, it is a stunning um, and riveting memoir format, especially for someone so young. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, that means a lot. I. It's been very scary to be so vulnerable, both in the book and then talking about the book too. Um, but I keep reminding myself that it's changing people's lives. And I've got so many letters from people who said, thank you. And you know, they lost their father too, or they've struggled with coming out or anything. And um, even just dads, a lot of dads. Uh, it's a great Father's Day book. So thank I you for that. I just sent it to my dad. I oh, you did? Yeah, of course I did. Great. <laughs> Um, and um, we are arranging an actual on-site book signing uh, for later in this summer. So maybe um, you will uh, yeah. grace us with a couple of bottles of the Dell Cellar. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, love so that. Make it into that. Because now that we are thinking about on-site events, 
Yes. And share wine together. I would um, love that very much. Fantastic. So we will see you then. In the yes. meantime, we do have the event on Saturday, which you are a part of. This is a discussion um, called Queering Woodcraft, and everybody is invited to join. Um, we will have a number of um, woodworkers who um, share queer identity speaking um, at this first um, discuss discussion oriented event that will be the first of um, a series and we're really excited for that and Trent will be part of that. I'll be so, there. Thank you so much. We can't wait. Um, Thanks a lot. I love it. Thank you very much. On the website. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This conversation will be available in the woodshed and um, we look forward to seeing you soon. Everybody enjoy this beautiful evening and um, see you at the center soon. Thank you. I'll see you Saturday night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Brent, this is what I meant. This is what I meant by a a boat with holes. Oh. This is a bowl with holes. A bowl with. Oh well, there you go. I think that's with a nat natural. Uh, oh, the occlusions from the. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do it. Thanks to you. Someday, there's gonna be a non-floating boat out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it started here, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.